I was prosecuted for crimes I did not commit, all in the hope that my prosecution would further the police investigation of me as a suspect in the disappearance of William Terrell. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was 71-year-old Bill Spedding on the steps of the New South Wales Supreme Court last week, claiming that the New South Wales Police and the media had combined to wreck his life by hitting him with 30-year-old child sex charges that a court had long ago found to be false. The criminal charges brought maliciously against me by police destroyed me and publicly portrayed me as a pedophile. My reputation was severely and permanently damaged. My family life was torn apart. And was he innocent of all charges? You bet, with the court awarding him almost $1.5 million in damages for what Spedding called his terrible nightmare, which is compensation from the state of New South Wales for malicious prosecution, misfeasance in public office and collateral abuse of process. So how did it come to this? The former washing machine repairman was outed as a person of interest in the 2014 disappearance of William Tyrrell. The same detectives investigating the missing toddler charging spedding with unrelated child sex offences in 2015. He spent 58 days in prison, most of that time in solitary confinement, and when released endured public ridicule and harassment. The allegations turned out to be fake and the case was thrown out at trial. And how did the media help in bringing Bill Spedding down? By taking the word of the police and shouting it to the heavens. Starting in January 2015, four months after three-year-old William Terrell vanished, when Spedding appeared on multiple front pages as a person of interest. And from that moment on, the old man was in the spotlight, with the media fortuitously on hand when police searched his property. Bit by bit, police combed through earth dug up at the rear of this semi-rural home. A truck is used to drain a septic tank, a task of investigators to find evidence that can shed any light on the disappearance of William Tyrrell. When they arrested him three months later, the media just happened to be there again, camped outside his house with cameras for eight hours before the cops arrived. And when he was released on bail three months after that, the media were there again to jump on him as he emerged. How was jail, Bill? His relative, Colin Youngry, trying to shelter the alleged pedophile. You're on private property. Now, if you don't off, I'll call the police immediately. And when Spedding fronted court, the media were once again all over it, every time. In 2018, the charges against Spedding were dismissed. And in last week's scathing judgment, Justice Ian Harrison slammed New South Wales police for bringing them in the first place, finding that... Mr Spedding was subjected to a long and painful ordeal. It never should have occurred. The allegations for which he was prosecuted were old and discredited. They were frail and notoriously so. New South Wales police knew that at the time, according to the judge, who found the investigating officer, Detective Brennan, withheld crucial evidence from the defence and the court. So why were the charges ever brought? In the words of Justice Harrison, the criminal proceedings were instituted and maintained for the dominant purpose of furthering the investigation of Mr Spedding as a suspect in the disappearance of William Tyrrell and to punish him for his suspected involvement. The police strategy was to put pressure on Spedding and hope he would crack. And the then lead detective, Inspector Gary Jubilin, wrote a memo to his superiors to tell them the media would play a crucial part. So, how did reporters know when Spedding was to be arrested? Simple, said the judge. Although Inspector Jubilant disavows any knowledge of who informed the media outlets that Mr Spedding was to be arrested, I am satisfied that despite his denial, either he or an officer under his command, and in accordance with his direct instructions, let the television stations and other news organisations know that a suspect in the disappearance of William Tyrrell was to be apprehended or arrested and that Mr Spedding's address at the relevant times was given to them. The actions of police, prosecutors and the media saw Spedding subjected to death threats, a violent assault and vile abuse, with the so-called police facts in the ancient sexual assault case, which weren't facts at all, feeding salacious headlines and stories like this in the News Corp Mastheads. Accused child rapist Bill Spedding repeatedly raped a three-year-old girl in a caravan in Campbelltown and farmed children out to fellow pedophiles, police allege. And this in the Nine Papers. There is evidence of other adult offenders who are complicit in similar child sex offences, both independently and in conjunction with the accused in this matter. The police fact sheet states. And of course, the Daily Mail was also kicking him hard. 
despite the obscenity of the charges, Spedding's wife Margaret supported him in court and they pressed their hands against the glass when he was refused bail. Widespread media coverage like that comprehensively destroyed Bill Spedding's reputation, said Justice Harrison, who found that Spedding was wrongly branded a pedophile and the likely abductor of William Tyrrell. And has the media paid for any of its damaging coverage? Well, a little. The Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph have both coughed up substantial amounts in damages to settle defamation actions. And uh, headlines on their front pages acknowledging their error? Unfortunately not. Meanwhile, it appears police and the media may be risking a repeat by putting similar pressure on William Tyrrell's foster mother. It's a mystery that has gripped our nation for years. Where is William Tyrrell? Now the officer leading the search for the missing three-year-old has revealed he believes William's foster mother knows where his body is. The foster mother, who cannot be identified, has never been charged with William's disappearance and denies any wrongdoing or involvement. But last month, during a hearing that cleared her of giving false or misleading evidence to the secretive New South Wales Crime Commission, a similar police MO to that of Bill Spedding was revealed. Today, an insight into how detectives hoped she would crack. You were hoping to break her spirit. Is that why you brought these charges? One homicide officer was asked. I formed the view that she knows where William Tyrrell is. The court also heard how officers went to the foster mother's house in the hope of a confession, telling her, as they told Spedding, they knew she was involved in his disappearance. Today's the day you make a decision for William, police told her. We aren't bluffing, we know why, we know how, we know where. Why haven't you got him, she responded. New South Wales police also brought pressure on the foster mother last year by announcing a new search of bushland near the house where William was last seen and briefing journalists that she could have dumped his body nearby. A heart-stopping moment. Police found a piece of red stringy fabric. Was it part of William Tyrrell's famous Spider-Man suit he was wearing when he vanished? Officers believe this is his graveyard. Reporters were primed by police to expect a breakthrough and eagerly anticipated each clue that would crack the cold case open, like this replica gun. It was found in rugged bushland less than a kilometre from where William went missing. It's among 31 items bagged and sent away for further examination so far. However, officers don't believe it is linked to the case. Not linked to the case, but in the absence of anything else, it got primetime billing. Much like this discovery, five days later. What was the focus for detectives today? Georgie, it was a glimpse of red that caught everyone's attention here on site this afternoon. A large piece of fabric that was found at the bottom of a creek that police managed to drain earlier today. The media happily swallowed police PR that Williams' remains would soon be unearthed, even though that never seemed likely. And in the end, after a four-week search, absolutely nothing was found. As journalist Leah Harris told 10 News on the eighth anniversary of his disappearance... It's one of the biggest cases New South Wales Police has ever run and yet in the past 12 months we've learned nothing new about what happened to William. What we have learned is that police can't always be trusted and that they use the media to put pressure on people who may turn out to be innocent. It is the media's job to be sceptical, not sensational, because as this case shows, getting it wrong can be expensive and hugely damaging. But now to the leader Australia rejected, who last week blamed the media for not uncovering the fact that he secretly took on five ministerial portfolios while he was PM. Had I been asked about these matters at the time at the men numerous press conferences I held, I would have responded truthfully about the arrangements. This was an abuse of power and a trashing of our democracy. Last week, the federal parliament notched up a first by voting to censure the former prime minister. But Mr Morrison did not go quietly. I have no intention now, Mr Speaker, of submitting to the political intimidation of this government using its numbers in this place to impose its retribution on a political opponent. And in an angry 24-minute diatribe, he blamed the media and his fellow MPs for failing to expose what he had kept secret from everyone in that chamber even though a judicial report by former High Court Justice Virginia Bell last month said his actions had corroded public trust in government. So apparently it's the fault of this House that these errors were made. Apparently it's the fault of this Parliament that this misconduct occurred. Apparently it's the fault of the Fourth Estate that these errors occurred and this misconduct occurred. So did the Fourth Estate, that's the media, really fail to ask the question? 
And would Mr Morrison have told them if they had? Short answer, not likely. As anyone who's followed Mr Morrison's career would know, getting a straight answer from him was often a challenge. As press gallery veteran Laurie Oakes observed back in 2013... Sometimes when he fronts the fourth estate, Scott Morrison's arrogance can be little short of breathtaking. And in 2014, when the media wanted to confirm the arrival of an asylum seeker boat during his spell as immigration minister, we had this famous example. There is no such report for me to provide to you today. If there was a significant event happening, then I would be reporting on it. So what does that mean? If the boat well, actually I'm, sinks, I'm, you'll tell us? You're a bright until... journalist. I'm sure you can work it out. No, we're asking you, sir. You're the minister. And, you're the and I've given minister. you my response. Well, I'm, yeah, I don't you understand your response. response. Nevertheless, Morrison's former deputy PM, Michael McCormack, who was once a newspaper editor, was arguing last week that journalists could have got an answer on all those secret ministries if they'd only tried a little harder. Being a former journalist, I often wondered why journalists just didn't say to him, Prime Minister, what would happen if the Minister for Finance or the Minister for uh, whatever portfolio would, would, would come down with COVID? And I'm sure he would have said, I'm sure he would have said, well, I'll fill that role or I'll appoint somebody else. But would he? Because Mr Morrison had several chances to tell journalists of the responsibilities he had acquired, and he flunked them all. In December 2021, for example, journalists grilled him on his decision to cancel a permit for gas exploration off the coast of Newcastle, prompting him to reply... And I decided to take the decision as the Prime Minister, which I, um, I'm authorised to do. But, in fact, he was only authorised because he'd been secretly sworn in by the Governor-General as the Industry and Resources Minister. He could have made that clear, but he did not. Strike number two came on the eve of this year's election. When journalists asked about allowing the Biloela family to return to the community, Morrison stated... That ministerial intervention power is, is done by the minister, not the prime minister. That's not what the act provides. Can you talk he to makes the minister? that decision. No, that, it, it's Will his talk decision. To Alex Hawke? No, it's his decision. But it was in fact within Morrison's power because he'd been secretly sworn in by the Governor General to administer Home Affairs as well. Again, no disclosure. And in August, when three of Morrison's secret ministries were revealed, 2GB's Ben Fordham asked directly... Are there any other portfolios that you assumed any control over? Not to my recollection, Ben. I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing that, but not to my recollection. In fact, there were two others for a total of five. So, even when Morrison got direct questions, he did not give direct answers. And what did the media make last week of his attempt to blame them for his failure to disclose? News Corp's Samantha Maiden summed up their reaction. Many journalists were certainly questioning their grasp on reality when the former Prime Minister tried the argument on for size. This was an utterly absurd claim, as anyone who has ever tried to ask him a question in a press conference knows. Indeed, they do. So, was it the media's fault? No, Mr Morrison, it was yours. And finally, to a message on climate change from the editors of some New South Wales country newspapers. Forget the poetry. We need action. The poetry being Dorothea McKellar's 1908 classic, My Country. Of drought and flooding rains. And the memo from the editors was clear. It's an enduring piece of prose, but not a disclaimer for our political representatives to hide behind. Climate change is happening now. Our region is suffering its effects now. Towns across the central west of New South Wales, where these papers are published, have been hammered recently by multiple flood events. Like here in Forbes... From the air, you can see the impact that it is having. It has split the community of Forbes into two. And here in Yugara, which the flood didn't so much split as obliterate. And in an open letter to Canberra, the editors were demanding action to protect them in the future. The short window of time between devastating drought and flood has revealed inescapable truths about how unprepared we are to deal with these climate extremes. Extremes that are predicted to become more prevalent. And their message was, don't give us a 114-year-old poem as reason for inaction. But that barb might also be aimed at the pundits on Sky, who love to quote McKellar to show that climate change hysteria, as they call it, is much exaggerated. Seems our experts keep forgetting that Australia really is a land of droughts and flooding rains. Flooding rains follow droughts, which follow rains, which follow droughts. That was Andrew Bolt last month. And here's another poetry fan on Sky reacting to the floods in western New South Wales. We're always going to have floods in this land of droughts and flooding rains. And uh, also to the floods in Victoria in October. And that's why we've all grown up knowing ours is the land of droughts and flooding rains. 
Yes, Chris Kenny is a true McKellar lover, also citing her famous words in February, just days before thousands of people lost their homes and livelihoods to floods in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales. In this land of droughts and flooding rains, we will always have to battle the vagaries of our weather. And again in March. They are not new. Floods, droughts, fires, heat waves and storms have always been with us and always will be, especially in this land of droughts and flooding rains. Those February floods alone cost an unprecedented $5.5 billion in losses, according to the Insurance Council of Australia. But the rains were nothing to get alarmed about, said another McKellar buff, Sky's Peter Credlin, channelling you-know-who in March. As Dorothea McKellar observed over a century ago, Australia has always been a land of drought and flooding rains. Two weeks ago, the nation's top climate scientists had more bad news with a report on the state of the climate predicting... Dangerous bushfires will rage for longer, torrential downpours will become more common and unrelenting heat waves will devastate communities across Australia. That warning was greeted with scepticism by some commentators at Sky and by Chris Kenny in particular. And while we don't have a poem for him, we do have a proverb, which is relevant, dating back to 1546 and ultimately to the Bible, and it goes, there are none so blind as those that will not see. That's all from us for tonight. Don't forget our latest episode of Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and iView. We'll be back again next week at the same earlier time of 8.30 for our final show of the year. And until then, goodbye.